you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Sheriff Gregory. Uh, Dr. Faber, if you will. Yeah. Um, can you give me share privileges and I'll just uh, put up the slides? Yes. Hold on. Let me see. Okay. Uh, this is where I need your rod. How about if I make you a co-host? I think if I make you a co-host, yeah, I'll allow you to do that. I'll do it. Okay. Yeah, do it, Lynn. That's Got it. Abracadabra. We'll see if the slides come up. I'm going to share my screen. Let's hope this works. All right. So everyone should be sharing, seeing my screen. Now let's just go back. Um, and I, this is where I love teamwork. Um, I was uh, grateful enough to get some assistance uh, this morning from Deb just to get uh, slides made with her wonderful template and uh, we put some things together. This will be a talk that will be um, an, an engaging talk, hopefully. So if you got questions, um, reach out, say things. Uh, Deb, if you could help, I, I, sometimes on Zoom, I'm not the best one to know to see if things are showing up or people have questions. So feel free to, to jump in or interrupt, throw in your two cents. Okay. Uh, as well. Sheriff Gregory, I'm glad to have you here. Uh, and Elizabeth, what a story. I didn't know you did all this work on entrepreneurialism for, for people within the community. I'd love to hear some of that. And uh, Jamie, who I'm coming to increasingly respect more each day, is truly a, a story of hope. He's a story of inspiration. And I think he's a story of mental toughness of what, what, can, what can you become when you've got some support network behind you and in his book by the way uh, on how to become more genuine uh, and yourself an icon is, is definitely worth the read so um that said thank you sheriff gregory uh alina's not here um alina has done some great work with music and uh people at the prison and how to use music as a means to help calm people uh, as well. And then for me, here's me, uh, my book Escape, I hope you can see in the right hand corner, which just as an aside, you can purchase the book on Amazon, but the, the people who need it the most are really those who are in the system. So the book can be downloaded for free uh, at my website, www.drjfaber.com. So, um, and to me, that book on the download, it's got more artistry and more aesthetics uh, and more applicability than, than the book. So uh, and it's free. So for those who want to look at it or think people who might be able to benefit from it, uh, feel free uh, to take a look at that. Okay. And I've got everything from stories from Michael Jackson to Elon Musk, uh, and then from people um, who've actually gotten better, um, better meaning you're living on the streets and six months later, you're wanting to join the Navy SEALs. Um, so there is, there's hope. We're in, we're in an exciting time. Uh, all the stuff about me and the accolades you can read uh, on your own. I really am emphasized in, 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 in health, um, both brain health, but I think also just physical health in general. So, you know, brain healthy communities, what is it? You know, who cares? You know, what's that all about? It's another nice concept, you know, and I think of how to kind of dramatize this. I, I run a foundation on the side and this summer I had uh, dinner uh, done on sunset with a number of inner city young adults and, and I sat with one of the 20 year old males who's into music and we started talking about their different things and this was like one of those kind of whoa moments for me I he said he graduated from high school I said well, what was it like when you graduated from high school he says well it's kind of weird I go well, what do you mean it's weird he says well you get your diploma and then you're done and it's like I don't know what to do with my life no one's show me what schools to go to what are my interests what are my passions you're just done. And I go, what did you do for the whole summer? He says, I just sat at home, played video games, you know? Um, and I asked, well, who are your friends? You don't want to go much into friends. So you can imagine what that's all about. And I said, well, you know, what, what class were you like wishing you got more in, in, in high school? And, and surprisingly, at least to me, he says, well, mathematics. And I go, well, you know, mathematics. I go, he says, why? He says, well, he says, Jay, I don't even know how to do a checkbook. I don't, I don't know how to add numbers. No one's even taught me finances. And now that you're out in the real world, you have to know how to deal with money. And I go, what did the teacher do in class in mathematics? And he went on to talk about how you'd come in, you'd get a kind of a road assignment, you'd sit down, no one talks to anybody, and you just, you know, add up the columns. 
I go, so there's no pragmatics. There is no like, what if you had a, an opportunity to gain 5% on $100 in two years? How much would you? They, no, nothing like that at all. And then I finally asked him, I go, well, who's your support now? And, and he says, you know, uh, at home, I guess, my mom, my dad, when they're around. And I'm like, this is, this is crazy. Uh, and, 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 and it made me think just what an epidemic we have right now with our no offense school system, our educational system, our, our communities, what kind of aesthetics environments we have for our people we live in. And we're going to talk about all that. But boom, who cares when we don't care? And that includes me. OK, and and I'm not perfect. I've had my moments. And part of my reason for it in the book is because I know what it's like not to have everything either. Um, maybe not as much as other people. Jamie knows some of my story. I won't get into it. But man, we've got to figure out how uh, and why for everyone, which has, each has only and really why, and what we can start to do uh, to make uh, things better. So, you know, in, 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 a, in a question that brings up is like, if you're going to have a, a brain healthy community, you know, one question was, well, what skill sets you're going to need? And, and I'll be honest, I think the skill sets are far differently than just reading, writing, and arithmetic. All those are important. But what about leadership skills? Back to Elizabeth, entrepreneurial skills, dream building, goal setting, confidence. I mean, and, and they're kind of like trite words, but there's a lot of sophistication that's out there uh, when, we, when, when we start looking. And if we're going to learn these skill sets, who do we go to? Who can we turn to specifically in our, our, our communities uh, to, to get this information? And I'll be honest, I ask this myself probably once a week. And I have a hard time sometimes, except for looking at books like Jamie's and other individuals to get that. Then how do you measure if you're learning these skills? Um, how many people get graded after high school or college? I mean, in many ways to me, I felt like I was being measured more in college and high school than beyond. Because if you don't have a system taught within yourself, there's not much out there. And oh, by the way, how much more do we have to learn uh, after college? Me, maybe after residency where I came out that I knew um, everything I needed to, I'm ready to go, only to find out 10 years later, not five, Harvard Business Review said, you know, if you don't keep up with your area of expertise in five years, you're, you're, you're behind the eight ball. And I'm like, and I started looking at stuff and they, they were right. You know, what do we do? What do we do with these people after they get to high school or college just to continue to develop brain health? Okay. And why is it so important to learn these skill sets? Okay. Now, this is my opinion is when we don't learn the skill sets, guess where people end up going? Okay. They end up going into places we're going to talk about prison, legal system, substance abuse programs. You know, they end up going places that aren't so great. So, brain healthy communities. What exactly is it? And this is just, I, I, and I did this purposely. This is sort of my medical definition and it's just medical. Guess what? We've got other entities in the room. We've got Elizabeth, who I would love to hear just from an entrepreneurial standpoint, what that's like. We've got Sheriff Gregory and her aspects from what is a safe community, public community, and what sophisticated, and I use the word sophisticated purposely because we, it's not contrite. These are, these are people who have seen it, smelt it, and know it. And with respect to all disciplines, guess what? We can make this place a, a better world. So, you know, from a medical perspective, what is brain communities? It's developing brains to work at their highest biological capacity. We're now at a place, you know, and I'll show you some pictures here in a, in a bit. On, on being able to develop our temporal lobes, which help a lot with mood control and memory, our frontal lobes, with help, which help a lot with executive functioning, our basal ganglia, which help a lot with controlling our anxiety and keep us away from drugs. Um, we're now at a place, and it's really exciting, where we can use supplements, um, kind of like when you go to the gym and you take your creatinine and protein powders. There's other things we can take to give our brain to help it work better. Now, it's not only supplements. We need to feed our brain's nourishment to enri enrich its natural functioning. Now, that said, um, what are we feeding ourselves? What are we feeding our kids? And, and how much knowledge do we have about what's in the long term going to be most healthy for our brains to subside? 
or to subside in a healthy environment. Uh, then three, avoiding toxic agents that deplete our brain resources, you know, drugs, alcohol, but also some other things, uh, homes these days with mold, mildew, um, pipes with lead, heavy metal. I mean, it, it goes beyond the normal. And this sounds simple and it sounds trite, but when you get into the, 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 the dynamics and then more importantly, when you see the results, what happens if you don't take care of these things, it, it can be very concerning. Uh, next, uh, brain health and communities practice activities that enrich our brain capacities. We're reading, we're writing, um, we're using brain games. We're doing simple things like crossword puzzles, word puzzles, sodoku, even any of this can help. And then last, and this is really important, we begin to start networking with groups that promote brain health. And brain health, big word, very symbolic. And I think as Jamie mentioned, we're going to see a whole lot more of the emphasis on brain health and why it's so important. Because when we don't, guess where we see the results? The end result, my opinion, is people who end up in our prison system. Okay, and speaking of our prison system, someone mentioned already, um, and, and this is when I wrote my book, this is the kind of stuff that started boggling my mind, um, substance abuse. I thought it was gonna be like maybe 50% of people. 85%, if you look at the data, 85% of people in prison they have a substance abuse problem. I mean, that's astounding. And, and you start asking, if we were able just to address this, how many people would we have in our prison system? Now take out the substance abuse. People in prison system, they've had a seven times higher rate of brain injuries. Okay. Philadelphia Children's Study, um, they did a study, and I'll, I can get the, the specific one from the American Psychiatric Association. This came out about a year ago. Fascinating work. They followed like 10-year-olds through 18 and did MRIs and they looked at the thickness of their cortex and the whole volume of their cortex um, to see how they were stratified in the people who came from low socioeconomic, middle socioeconomic, and high socio socioeconomic settings. The people in the low socioeconomic settings, the, the cortical thickness was smaller and their whole cortical volume was less. Now, what does that mean? It's sort of like when you look at somebody who's working out, okay, they got big muscles, and they look great. They're in shape. People with thin cortex, they can't learn as fast. Their memory's not as good. Okay. They're not able to be as creative. Okay. How many of these people that we're seeing in our prisons come from low SES settings? It doesn't take a rocket scientist to look at what we're seeing on the news to know it's a lot. And how many of these people didn't get the proper nourishment, just food wise growing up to help their brains develop? You know, and, and it brings me to the question, are these people in jail, are they bad people? Or instead, are they just people who've got bad brains? Because if they have bad brains, then maybe, just maybe, we need to start doing something about it. And not just for the people in prison, but for all of our communities. Jamie Mustard last two weeks ago, couldn't have said better. He asked me, he says, do we have a health epidemic right now in jails? by not taking care of brains. And you think of what we don't do in jail, what do we do for these people after they get out of jail? <laughs> do we send them to see a neurologist? Do we send them to see a psychiatrist? Do we send them to see a nutritionist? Do we help them get work? Okay, or are they just left on the street as we're seeing and then left to be on their own? I wonder why the recidivism rate of people going back into jail is so high. Okay, so in summary, I mean, what we end up seeing is this, is the people in the legal system have got bad brains, okay? The people in the legal system, a lot of them have drug and alcohol issues, okay? Some have got behavioral issues. Um, this is just from our clinic. We see a lot of football players who've had bad, bad injuries. Um, there was a case last year in San Diego, a well-known tight end, I'm not going to mention names, who had horrible, horrible head injuries, and he was arrested um, for sexually assaulting two different women, and now he's serving time in prison. And it's like, well, okay, I can understand why he needs to be safe, but what are they doing in terms of hyperbaric oxygen therapy, supplements to help rehab this person's brain while they're creating, a, to my perspective, a punitive situation 
where you're being labeled as a bad person and not really dealing with someone who's got a bad brain. So, um, Dr. Faber, can I make a quick comment? Just yes. On, and I'll just dash in and dash right out because this was really the point of your book that really moved me. I should also say, you know, I'm, I'm uh, writing for uh, Forbes Ignite, which is the social innovation arm of Forbes, which is attacking a lot of these issues. They're launching a new magazine. Uh, and, the, and I've been hired as a writer there. I'm doing my first story on uh, brain health and the criminal justice system. And the only comment I wanted to make was that um, if, you have, if you have a substance abuse problem, you have, you're gonna have an oxygen flow issue in, the, in your executive function, the frontal cortex. You can correct me on the science here, Dr. Faber, of your brain, you're gonna make bad decisions. So if you have two people in the neighborhoods I grew up in, uh, they get into an argument that are armed, right? There's a biological imperative at play here that no one's talking about. This is what has really drawn me into this, right? And when you get into conversations about um, accountability and criminal justice, those get very politicized, right? If, it's, if you're on the left side, it's about rehabilitation. If you're on the right side, it's about accountability. And I'm not interested in any of that. What I think, what I, what kind of turned my head around when I was reading Dr. Faber's book is I believe the data, I believe the science. And to me, um, and this is, you know, I would love to at some, maybe later on the Q and A hear what um, Sheriff uh, Gregory has to say about this, but to me, it's a public health issue. If there's a biological imperative that's landing all these people in jail uh, and no one's talking about it and then we're letting them out, right? That's a public health issue. That's not a political issue. And I feel like by reframing this as a public health issue, um, A, we would help a lot of people and B, we take all the, the BS politics out of it. So that I just wanted to, to pipe in and say this was the part of his book that just literally got my wheels turning. And you know now I'm doing my first article for this new uh, Forbes magazine on this subject, because I really do feel, as I said before, this is the elephant in the room that no one's talking about. 90, um, and uh, and it, it offer, it, and if, if people understood it as a public health issue, there's no there's a biological imperative. People are going to do things when they get out. I think maybe we could start to see um, changes and I wanna shine uh, light on that. That's, so that's why I'm here. Anyway, thank you for letting me pipe in there, uh, Dr. Faber. Thank you, Jamie, very much appreciate it. Anyone, and if, you, if anyone else wants to chime in or has comments, uh, feel free to throw things in. Dr. Faber, I'm looking at Jamie Whitehurst, whom I've known for many, many years and Jamie, retired as a longtime educator, school principal in the public school system. Um, don't wanna just call on you, Jamie, but as I'm listening, I'm thinking, okay, why would someone who is not rearing children now, who's gone on to another aspect of life, why would we care about this? And Jamie, the other Jamie, Jamie Mustard has, has shown the reason I think. Yeah, I think we're, we're going to talk about a little bit about just how we need, if this is going to go in your community, okay, Richmond, this is where a book like Change Your World by John Maxwell, which by the way, if you haven't taken a look at it, it's really powerful and talks about who are the people to get involved of which a big part is our educational system and our educational leaders. We're going to talk about that as we talk about some of the opportunities um, here as well, which, you know, this would be a good place. I, I would be curious to hear uh, in your, in, in the, in the people on the phone, in communities, any stories you have about legal issues, someone, you know, in the neighborhood got arrested, uh, someone who stole, assaulted, a any stories that stick out in your mind? And I'd be fascinated just to know what they are because it gives me a sense concretely about what else is going on in, in, the, ne in the neighborhoods of others um, to see what needs to be done. I'm thinking about one young man who at um, age 18 months, was taken out of the home. When you look at his foster care case, open the folder. I've spent 13 and a half years in social services. 
you open the folder, you look to the left, start with the medical history. The child is brought into the local hospital and the diagnosis is failure to thrive. You pick up the baby, you pull the back of the baby's head. If the baby's head is flat, that indicates that, yeah, he might be not, he might not be thriving. They prop the bottle, put the baby's head on a pillow, prop the bottle with another pillow. So he's not getting that human interaction that's needed. Okay, so the mom at the age of the child's birth was 14 years old. Her boyfriend didn't like the child, um, kicks the child, literally kicks the child down the stairs. They bring the child into the emergency room and try to quote, sneak out of the emergency room. Um, the child ends up in surgery, gangrene in the intestines, 18 inches of the intestines removed and he moves from one home to another. Before he's 25 years old, he's arrested for murder and that's where he's living. I write letters to him now and I'm amazed at how brilliant he is. He feels responsible for what he did. I don't have those discussions with him yet, but there are a lot of missing pieces here and nobody's looked at his brain or looked at the impact that his early childhood beginnings have had on the decisions that he made in life. Did he commit the crime? He and I don't discuss that. He feels responsible. But going back to what you've been saying, Dr. Faber, look at the deficit that he had at the start. Maybe he'll get out next year and he'll be 50 years old. So he's been 25 years of his life. Yeah. Um, just as a, uh, as a sequel, I'm going to try to do a couple things here. One is, here is, uh, and I'm going to try to sneak something else out. Dr. Faber, could I share a quick story just that yes. relates right to what she said? You know, yeah. one of the reasons I'm so interested in this subject is, you know, I crossed class in Los Angeles. You know, I started where I started and I ended up where I ended up before I left. And about 10 years ago, I had a friend, and I won't say his name, but a very successful Hollywood actor star in one of the biggest white get kid really handsome star in one of the biggest shows on television star of hollywood movies and we kept our motorcycles together he was my neighbor in los angeles we rode on the weekends and not and i felt guilt about this not long after i left los angeles he fell over on his motorcycle and hit his head there was and not right after that his life hit a very big downward spiral. He started using drugs. He started, um, this is a guy that had in his mid twenties that had, was making money, had the world ahead of him. Okay. Star of one of the biggest shows on all of TV. And he started getting into arguments, people committing assault, getting going, getting in and out of jail. And within a year, of him falling on his bike and hitting his head about a year and a half. Um, he was staying at a rehab facility in Los Feliz in Los Angeles, um, murdered his landlord, dismembered her cat, and then jumped to his death all in a two hour period. I was, this guy was a close friend of mine and it completely jarred me. So when I saw, when I read Dr. Faber's book, I just saw truth in it. And it doesn't know race and it doesn't know class. If you, if you have this injury, these injuries or lack of blood flow in your brain, um, you're going to make very bad decisions and hurt people. And it's a biological imperative likely that has nothing to do with what kind of person you are. Cause this guy was a really, really good person. Uh, and, uh, but it didn't stop him from doing what he did. So anyway, I just wanted to say that as a story because uh, listening to Deborah um, made me remember that story. You know, I, I've ever since I met, read Dr. Haber's book, I've just been electrified by this issue. And I just was, as I was listening to you, Deborah, I made that connection. So thank you. <laughs> you know, this is real, a real thing. And I, and I just have a feeling that we're going to hear, be hearing a lot about it because I really do think with all the things going on, this may be the fundamental pillar of all of it. 
in terms of why people are ending up in the system. Anyway, I'll step out. Thank you, Dr. Faber. Thanks, Jamie. Um, and, and just now on both stories, you know, because this is dark stuff. I mean, this is not like things you want to talk about at dinner or at the coffee table, but this is part of life. And um, the, 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 the sort of this is the hard part. And we see this a lot at the office. There's good parts with this as well. I was going to show you, this is a typical picture. We do what we call blood flow scans of the brain. We look at where the brain's getting too much blood flow or too little. This is looking at the brain from the top down, bottom up, left side, and here's right side. Colors on these pictures mean nothing. Okay, we just put these on here, make them look pretty. Um, the texture, though, is like telling us everything. The more bumps we see or holes, there's less blood flow to those areas. So for people with trauma, wherever you get hit, you can see a bump. So if you get hit in the front, here's the front of our brain, we might see bumps. Secondly, as soon as your head hits, it goes back. The back of our brain can hit our skull. Okay, now we got bumps in the front, which makes it hard to come up with making good decisions. In the back, we might have some issues with reading and with learning. But that said, this is what I wanted to do. If I can do this, put down a button. Okay, these are another set of slides. And this is the kind of stuff. Can you see this brain here? Mm -hmm. See all the bumps and holes this guy's got? Yes. So he did something called play NFL football. And, and uh, nine years after playing, here's what he came out with. By the way, the first thing he said to me, he says, uh, Jay, he says, the first thing I'd say to anybody is don't play football. Okay. Um, he couldn't get out of bed, was drinking like a fish. Uh, wasn't arrested, but he was having problems. We put him on supplements and he got better, but he still was 100%. I said, well, let's just do this. This thing called hyperbaric oxygen therapy, which I won't go into a lot of, but you basically go into what looks like a big tube increase atmospheric pressure and, and the oxygen concentration. You do about 40 to 50 sessions over a month. We did 40 and 50 days for him. And then he came back a month later. So let's get another scan. We got another scan and here's what his brain looked like. Wow. Mm. Wow. Yeah. I mean, and, and the other part couldn't get out of bed drinking like a fish. Now the guy's selling pharmaceutical goods 12 hours a day. All right. Now, you take a story like that, and then you apply that to some of the people that, that Jamie just mentioned, Deb just to, to talked to, I'd be willing to bet any one of us could think about two, three different stories where someone we're close to or you know, is, is in the neighborhood has had some kind of a legal altercation. And if there's something you can do while they're in the system and then subsequently out to get their brains looking more like this, would it not make sense. So Dr. Faber, this goes back to something that we learned, I learned in high school, that whatever brain cells you were born with, that was it. That you yeah. changed the brain. But now you're showing us that that's not true. Yeah, it's like we're seeing uh, with, with neuroscience, it's because we can now do non-invasive um, ways of looking at the brain. We're seeing that cells are plasticizing, they can grow, we can develop. And I think we're just five years from now, we're going to look back and say, what were we thinking today? And it's gotten um, so much better. So yeah, it's, it's like, if you've had head injuries, there, there's things you can do to help out. If you've used drugs and you're away from drugs, okay. And you do the hyperbaric, you, you, we've seen changes. Okay. So you take the 85% of people who are in prison, who've had substance use, have damaged their brains and then put them on a program where just where they go sit and get hyperbaric oxygen therapy, would it make a difference? You know, that would be worth an interesting study. Okay. And by the way, I'm being very sophisticated now in just biology. Okay. This is just the medicine piece. Okay. But it's a lot more than just medicine. Okay. If I was just going to come in and say, oh, look at me. And, 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 and this is kind of what I, when I started putting this together, so I don't want this to be all about medicine, although it's a big part of it. There's other factors as well, because when we look at a healthy community, um, I mean, it, this is wellness. Okay. What, what do we need to make our communities healthy? All right. Now there's eight things. This is all from the wellness spokes wheel. There are camps. I'm telling you right now, 
in Sedona, the, all they've done is they take each one of these concepts and put it on the schedule per day. And they're charging you 2000 bucks a day to go to the camps. Um, and they're making a lot of money and people come out most importantly, feeling better, but how do we, and this is where we got to get leaders. Okay. And, and I'm going to take this one step further is where do we go? What leaders do we need to participate if we're going to make a difference in our prison system, which, oh, by the way, it's then going to spill over in our own communities. What do we need? Because it's not just one person. We need physical and nutrition more like we're talking about now. Educate, get some healthcare people involved. Okay. Thinking, learning. How do we educate people after high school? How do we educate people in high school? What can we do differently? Uh, Prince Ia, who is to me a genius, if you haven't seen him on a YouTube, um, incredibly thought provoking person. But what do we do, education people? to get this to a whole nother healthcare, emotional wellness, our mental health care people, our therapists, how can they help? Aesthetics, how do we make our communities more appealing? How do we get greenery and trees in? Um, how do we get safe shopping malls? How do we even get a grocery store for Lord's sake in some of these communities? So rather than going up to the local, you know, 7-Eleven for lack of better words and getting a, a donut, you've actually can go up to a Whole Foods and get some healthy vegetables and apples and make something for your family that tastes great and it's more healthy for you. Uh, spirituality, uh, spiritual or finding a purpose. Where do we get church leaders? Where do we get people involved in synagogues, um, mosque, um, other entities, um, occupation, people, if they're going to be um, living life, they got to be working. You know, how do we use our local businesses in this area, financial stability. There, there's studies out now that and it's really fascinating on happiness is if you're making more than $70,000 or more, whatever the increment or more, your, your level of happiness, it doesn't change much. Below $70,000, the level of happiness goes way down. So what do we need to do in our communities to get this moving in a better direction? And how can our banking and loan industries help? I mean, this is where we all got to get together. Um, socially, how do we create networks? How do we create groups? How do we make community facilities, government, um, and maybe local businesses? What can we do together uh, to get this going at a much more sophisticated level, okay? Um, and my fear is if we don't, you know, I, I, you know after especially this last year, I'm really concerned about what's going to happen uh, to, to not only forget about the prisons, think about our neighborhoods um, and what's going to happen. And, and people can say whatever, but last year, Beverly Hills, I mean, people there never saw anything like that at all. And, and people are angry because they're not happy. They're not well. And we've got to get more connected and figure out how we can take this word, conceptualize it into something much better to make the world a better place. Okay, toxic brains, I mean, drugs, alcohol. This is the kinds of things we're seeing with drugs and alcohol. Look at all the bumps on these brains that they've got. And the good news is, guess what? If you stay away and we give you some supplements and some other things, there's a lot we can do to try to help out. Okay. Um, I was going to show one last picture here, and I think this kind of sums it up. This is, uh, since we're talking about legal system, this is a below surface picture of a fairly normal brain. There's a few things here. And then this is a, a violent juvenile. Our frontal lobes here, if we get bumps, we have a harder time focusing. Um, we also have a harder time just kind of controlling our thoughts. Our temporal lobes help control our mood. So people with problems here get angry really easy. Uh, they get frustrated really easily. If you've got big bumps here and there's no breaks on our temporal lobes, if they're not working well, like we've got here, we got an eruption ready to happen. Um, people like this get angry really readily and really quick. And it's, it's, and parents are baffled and we take a look and we say, we know what the issue is. There's things we can do to actually try to help these kids better. And we see it get better. So juveniles, what else are we doing? Okay. 
to help their frontal lobes and their temporal lobes get better. So in closing, and I leave this open, I hope we can have some, some great questions. You know, um, Larry Page, CEO for Google, you know, brilliant man. He says, hey, let's have a healthy disregard for the impossible. What can we do to make a community that doesn't have a park suddenly have a huge park where moms, dads, kids feel safe going and, and hanging out for Sunday afternoon? What can we do to transform some of our neighborhoods will actually have a good healthy grocery store that's safe to go into and buy food that are healthy and that are helpful for them. What are ways we can use the internet just to help people with their thinking and learning to get things uh, that they never learned, okay? In school, because schools might be too busy. Parents, they never learned themselves. They're too busy surviving. What, what can we do to help that? What can we do as governments to help make social connections where we're actually learning to value people both ways so we're increasing value for each other and making our communities a better place the brain is a huge starting point okay but deborah elizabeth jamie um and i i would believe that sheriff uh gregory we we've got to get everyone if we're going to do this involved and on that i i kind of open up questions thoughts comments disagreements i think this is you know, to out there. How do we get rid of the stigma? That's one question. The other piece is I was amazed to learn that when clinicians look at the brain rather than just at the person, that in 79% of the times they've changed the diagnosis. How do we, well, get, yeah. how do we get rid of the stigma? Well, I think you just hit the nail. We look at the, we got to change it from, from a mental health problem to a brain problem. And that it's, it's not someone's aura, their mentality. It's, it's what their brain is doing and not doing to get them better. Okay. But that's only one level. I mean, from a social community outreach, what else do we need to do to communicate um, broader conceptualizations with concrete, you know, understandable meanings uh, from it. I mean, Jamie said it's public health issue, public health crisis. What does that mean? How do we communicate that? How do we get that out to our communities? Uh, as a doctor, uh, do you think I, I can't do all that? I need people like Jamie, you know, who's been exposed to TV. How do you communicate this to get out? And I think that would be the same for Virginia as well. One thing that I'll say about the stigma, Deborah is I think by looking at the source of the problem, which in, I think in, if, you, if you've got a million people incarcerated, you know, 90% of which are black and brown and 85% of them have substance abuse issues, then 85% of them have brain health issues. You're gonna see these bumps and this shrinkage. And we look at where the stigma is that they're criminals, they're crazy, they're evil, right? Uh, to me, when you look at it as a biological imperative, it takes the stigma away. You know, it's, it, it takes that, you know, they're not crazy. They have a brain injury. And through, uh, and there's treatments, as he showed with supplements and the different therapies and um, uh, that were, I'm, I'm really motivated on this. I mean, I'm working with Dr. Faber on a project where uh, I'm documenting uh, brain issue, brain health issues in soldiers, sexual assault victims. And then I, and I'm looking to find five to 10 people involved in the criminal justice system. I want to scan their brains. I want to, with the help of Dr. Favor, treat them. And then I want to scan their brains again. And I want to show it on film. I'm in the middle of this film project. So I don't know if anybody has any resource that's resources where they can help me, but, uh, um, I want to show this to people uh, in a, in a, through, you, through the use of art and entertainment um, so that, pe you know, uh, it's never been done before. No one has ever gone, you know, I don't believe it's just a problem in terms of uh, the criminal justice system. I think if you go, go into the neighborhoods I grew up in, you would find a large percentage of people that grow up in inner city poverty are dealing with 
brain health issues, meaning we would see all these holes on a scan. And I think it's the fundamental issue that no one's ever heard of. Um, so yeah, I'm, I wanna, I'm, I'm looking to document this and I'm currently, this has been, they've, uh, I've been working with special forces in Fayetteville, North Carolina with, at Fort Bragg. And they've been treating these traumatic brain injuries and these addiction issues uh, and scanning their brains here and there for years and getting uh, improvements. Wow. Right. Um, but, and I was interviewing a special forces guy three weeks ago who was not only a Green Beret, but he'd been a, a gangbanger and a victim of sexual assault before he became a Green Beret. And one of the things that he kept saying in the interview is, I'm a special forces soldier. They will throw money at me endlessly to help me. But what about the guy on the block? What about the single mom in the neighborhood? He kept bringing it back to that because he was from that, right? Um, and so, and yeah, so I'm on a mission to show this on film and uh, Eamon Clinic and Dr. Faber are helping me do the scans. So I'm looking for people. Uh, the film is based in Chicago, but I'm willing to travel anywhere if someone can help me show this and prove it. Yeah, so thank you. We can do that, Jamie. Okay. So if anybody has any resources, please I would. email me. <laughs> oh yeah, we will, we will. The other thing is this, have you all heard of the term chins? Just like chin on your face, C-H-I-N-S. Have you all heard? I hadn't heard of it until maybe a year ago. Uh, children in need of supervision. So going back, Dr. Faber, to what you were saying, um, the that parents are busy, they're working. Sometimes after work, they're going to do, when they were leaving home to go to work, they were going to work on their uh, graduate degrees or whatever they were doing. Everybody has a cell phone. They have a door key and no supervision. That whole connection to the need for training and, and the awareness piece. So Jamie, we'll have to do obviously another call. Now, Chantal Alfred is on with us and Chantal has um, an international school, an online school. It's phenomenal. She's teaching like, you say it better than I do. Go ahead, Chantal. Oh, let me unmute you. I'm sorry. We need to unmute. We need you to unmute yourself. Okay. Can y'all hear me now? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Hi, I'm Chantel Alfred. I'm based in Dallas, Texas, and we have a virtual um, language platform where we educate um, business professionals as well as children. Um, we, we, when we started the program, um, everything's right now virtual, so it's, it's on Zoom, and uh, mentors told me, well, the majority of your uh, clients would, um, you know, be between 30 to 45 well, they're wrong because of Zoom. A good amount of them are seniors. <laughs> and then we have a lot of children who've joined because of homeschool. So our uh, network is growing. We, we, we started the platform about a year ago and we started with one student and now we're, we had like, uh, as of February, like 300 students. So it's growing now. We do a lot of community-based projects. And uh, Deb, I enlisted her to help me get the word out because we have a giveaway going on for our summer camp this, uh, in, this summer in July. So anyways, uh, happy to be here. I'm always excited to hear about the brain, how it works. And I was logged in a little bit ago and then got kicked out. So here I am again, and I might have to turn my camera off because we had a, I had a meeting, but thank you so much for having me. Very nice. Another resource, Jamie. Okay. Deborah. Um, yes. I want to thank you and Dr. Faber for what you have did today and to get rid of the stigma is education, mm -hmm. making people aware of what is going on. And a lot of people are not aware of how valuable the brain is. And especially our teenagers who are getting involved with the drugs, if they can see what that is doing to their brain and how it is leading them to uh, the disorder behavior or mental health. I believe that it would change. I do have a story, Dr. Faber. One of my students that was 
in the juvenile detention center. He came out, he changed his life, but he was hanging out with some of his boys. They got upset with him because of his life change and they actually blew his, bra blew his brain and it was in his hand. The brain was laying in his hand. They came in, they rushed him to the hospital. I want you to know 10 years later, this young man had to be rehabilitated, had to get a prostrate, he had to get his whole, whole face reshaped. But today, that young man has went back to school and he's uh, getting ready to graduate in computer technology. Wow. Now, wow. that's what you call resource. That's what you call determination. That's what happened when people come together in unity and work together and see how important it is to educate and start educating our children at the age when they can first start learning how important and how valuable their brain is, their body is. And we can accomplish this as a unit, as a community, and we can build healthy communities. And not only can we do it, but we are going to do it. Because Dr. Faber, you and Deborah, this day has to say, initiate the fire. And we're going to catch on. And I believe everyone in here, we can stay in contact with each other and we can be able to help provide those resources. We do have a TV program that's called uh, Youth Corporation, uh, Dawn Rising, and it will share the success stories. People need to hear the success stories and stop hearing all of the negative and all of the things that has happened in the world. We need to uh, come together as a community and help transform the juvenile detention center uh, as well as social, uh, social criminal justice. We as a community has to start that. We have to work with the politicians to do that. We have to work with the church-based faith business and businesses to do that. We as a unit coming together to make the change. And we have the people right here today. Jamie, you can, you can always use us as resource. We got people in, 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 in um, Pennsylvania, Richard was on here. He's in the construction business. We have people, uh, uh, we have Lowe here. We have Ger uh, uh, Gerard here. We have a whole private public community here private public community here that can come together and we can work together to make this happen. And Cheyenne there, she's in Florida. I mean, we got, we got, look at the many states we have right here. I didn't mean to preach, but that's the preaching part of me. So yeah. I love the passion and uh, the education piece. I like what you shared. Um, that person you talked about who was shot um, boy, I'd love to know how he went from being shot to even that part of the story to getting to where he is today. That's, that's a good story. Dr. Faber, one of the things that you, you offered was that we need to do this on a monthly basis. And we want to get the buy-in. Of course, we invited many other people, um, and at the end, I'll show a slide so you'll have an email address to which you can send your comments, your feedback. Is there a better day of the week, better time? And if there are others, if you're sitting here and you could think of some other folks who you wish were here to hear the information, for instance, I'm thinking even the folks who still may have some we day thinking, they might want to know about what they can do to avoid or slow down Alzheimer's? Is that something that we can get away from? Or is that an inevitable as we age? Um, that's one thing I was thinking. And the fact that, yes, I see Pat Oliver in Long Beach is raising her hand about that. Um, I got you, Pat. 
<laughs> Jamie, Jamie is questioning the same thing. What can we do to sew that down? Um, I was pausing because I'm thinking, all right, I'll stop because I want to change courses after, after mentioning that. But to learn that even when it comes to the police, that Amen Clinics with which Dr. Faber is working has a huge initiative now with the National Police Association. I don't know if that's the correct word, um, but when you think about it on the other side of the violence that we've been discussing, you've got the person who is not getting enough sleep. Maybe he or she is not wearing a helmet when they need to be wearing one. And they've seen a lot of violence. Sometimes it's second or third hand violence. What impact does that have on their ability to look at a situation as what Jamie was discussing earlier, and they're seeing something and assess it properly based on the challenges that they have during the, their day-to-day -day job. So just to make you all aware of that is another initiative that Amen Clinics, which has more than 180,000 brain spect images over the last 30 plus years. So when you look at the history that they have there, it, it, it's incredible. I mean, one of the ways we can help serve the communities is, um, you know, and Jamie's, Jamie and I have done some of this already, is, is we'll, we'll get the people in, we'll, we'll figure a way to pay for it, scan them. I'll review the scans, work for them, work with them pro bono to help them get on a plan to get their brain better. Uh, <sighs> and uh, Jamie's been really, I think, helpful igniting a huge, uh, this just personally a, a fire within several group entities. And, um, you know, everyone can do a little. I mean, I think our little is to just use our 30 some years of knowledge on brain neuroscience and, and start to show before and after pictures and, and have stories, right, that go with it mm -hmm. as well to say, hey, there's dark. I mean, it gets dark, but there's, there's light at the end of the tunnel. There was one slide that I found, if I can go back to our presentation. Um, I can go. You got to go? No, go, go ahead. You got it. Um, you know, I might need some help with this one. Oh, hold on. That I found real um, effective in sharing with young people. First of all, when you ask, do you own any real estate? Many people will say no, but when they begin to realize that the most valuable real estate that they have is the brain, and that when a baby is conceived, the first thing that develops is the brain, right? The next is the heart. And this slide I found to be very effective in sharing with young people. Notice what this has to show with regards to the type of brain that you want. And Dr. Faber, you were sharing with us some details about the number of families who have children who are using weed. Well, it's now legal, so what's the problem? It's legal now in many states. Help us with that. Well, I mean, the, the fascinating people in California, since it's got legal, I'll have our, you know, 16, <laughs> to 23 it's oh Cal california they finally go as pot it's a plant they finally woke up they realized that it's safe and in my comment and and i i just kind of stick with the science piece because i find it more effective there's two substances in the pot that give you the sort of high one is cannabinoid oil and so far the studies are looking really great and then two is thc and thc is is not your brain's best friend um, it will cause like, let's see the picture here. I mean, you can see the bumps here on the bottom, but they can get bigger. I mean, we can see it look the cocaine, alcohol, any of this can do the same thing. So there's that piece of it. The other piece, you know, for, for the age, it's like, well, okay, what does that mean? What does that look like in the real world? I mean, this is sort of all like things below the surface you can't see. So what I'll do is I'll show them like old movie pieces like of fast times at Ridgemont high where you look at Spicoli. Uh, and if, if you haven't seen Spicoli, he's definitely worth taking a look at. Um, Sean Pitt plays the part of like some dude who's smoking marijuana, like daily at school, um, talks like a beachhead, um, buys pizza and has it delivered to the, to the classroom. And the scenes are hilarious. I mean, just from a 
sort of a Hollywood, you know, comedy piece. But at the end, I mean, he didn't graduate the rest of his class. And it's like, well, what do you want to be the class clown? Or do you want to, you know, step it up, make your dream, whatever it is, come true. So it's going to be very interesting to watch. The other thing is the amount of THC per gram of pot has dramatically increased. Hmm. And, and so with that, we're seeing people come in more with um, psychotic symptoms, like they're having hallucinations or delusions or even weird stuff. Like I had one person from uh, Pepperdine come in who um, he was a straight A student and then he started smoking weed. And then after about six to eight months of doing it, he couldn't focus. He just woke up and he couldn't read. Uh, and his grades went from A's to like C's. And, uh, you know, we got him better. And then he left and then he started smoking again, which always kind of baffled me with, with, well, why would you do that again? And I've got a, the social pressure, I think was pretty high with him, but um, again, laws pass and then science can sort of follow. And we're going to follow this one real closely um, at the clinic. You know, we're concerned at the clinic. I'm concerned. Um, I see the cases that you typically don't see and it's not pretty. Um, and I think we're going to see more as the concentration of the THC goes up. Okay. Can I, can I say something? Just, yep. yeah. I mean, I, you know, just to kind of reiterate and kind of, you know, draw out your point, um, you know, when I read Dr. Faber's book, it kind of made me, it, you know, escape, rehab your brain uh, to stay out of the legal system. I started looking back on my childhood <laughs> and the violent acts that were around me or that I witnessed. And I tried to one for one ask myself, you know, what was the, that person's brain like? <laughs> you know, like did that was, was that a criminal? Was that an evil person? And one for one, I couldn't come up with an example of any incident that I witnessed where I thought the person involved that was committing violence um, had a healthy brain. That's why it kind of turned my head around. And I think it's fundamental to everything. And, you know, when, you know, I've got, I was somebody that's, you know, uh, gone through a tremendous amount of suffering and had to come out of it. And when you, I have a homeless brother in New York you know, so it's like this stuff is not in my past. It's always in my present. People think because of the life I have now that this is my past, but actually these things exist in my present. It casts a long shadow. And um, I, you know, when you suffer like that, you and you're an innocent child when it starts, you ask yourself, and then you have to climb out. You say, why climb out? You know, you ask yourself questions. You know, why, why would I do that? Right? How, what would be the point? And Part of it is, you know, what, what was the point of an innocent kid going through something like that? And the only thing, the only existential answer I can give myself about what I've lived through is hopefully that it increased my empathy so that I can try to do something to help others. I can see things that maybe other people don't see because I've lived through it, right? So special forces in, um, in uh, Fort Bragg are helping me with this film project that I'm doing. And when I, I think it's going to be a very powerful thing when I can have a special forces guy go through their symptoms and then I can cut from that person to somebody that's uh, in the criminal justice system and they will, and they describe the exact same symptoms. I believe that I can get people to see this. So um, it, this has been experimented, you know, you know, so, um, yeah, I'm looking for, again, I'm, I'm making a plea for help here. I want, I'm looking, I want to find a place where I can find concentrated five to 10 volunteers that, uh, are involved in the criminal justice system. So I can scan their brains, show them, give them some treatment, scan their brains again. And then, I, then I'm going to weave that. And then the, the lens of the special forces showing the same thing. I really think I can get people to see this in a way that is obvious when the symptoms are exactly the same. When the hardware breaks, the symptoms manifest itself identically, whether it's a gangbanger or whether it's a soldier that's been through war. 
So anyway, this is my, if you, if you have any resource of uh, people that you, you know, where, where I could find some people that I could show this, I think we could help a lot of people by filming this. And I'm, and I've already started filming it. So yeah, that's my plea. <laughs> okay. Uh, hey, Jamie, Jamie, we got you. <laughs> okay. Okay, cool. Thank you. you. And before I forget, anybody who wants to download Dr. Faber's book, Dr. Faber, would you give us your uh, web? Yeah, it's uh, www.drdrjjay, Faber, F as in Frank, A, B as in boy, E, R, at Amen Clinic, or no, Dr. J Faber, uh, dot com. Just Dr. J. Faber. I'm giving my other address, but www.drjfaber.com. Okay. And, and uh, just as I said, Jamie's looking at giving this movie at Sundance and at Con. Okay. Wow. So it's not like, wow, you know, uh, sort of a cute little film. I mean, this is the real deal. And he's an incredible producer. The person he has worth working with him is an incredible producer. And Chantal, you have up your hand. Yes, on mute, please. I just wanted to share uh, with the group, thank you so much for allowing us to, to be here, but also work with a nonprofit organization, um, a symphony in Dallas. And we had, uh, for the last couple of years, a program called Music in the Brain. And our president's son had a brain injury and they did a study with him to show how music helps the brain. So I'm excited to, I haven't seen the book yet, so I'm excited to uh, take a look and see, see what it has and, and to share it, share it with that organization. Thank you. Wow, with the symphony. Okay, so you know we'll be connecting, right? <laughs> <laughs> now, one more time, just to reiterate, why would a person who doesn't, quote, fit the profile of someone who's going into the system or is already in the system, why would the average citizen care? Just to reinforce that. Why would I not want to have, thank God, that's those people over there, not here. Um, can, I, can I say say something? Yes, ma'am. And I, and I say this because this is a lot of the reason why I do what I do. Um, I, I'm, a very, I'm a very spiritual person. Um, and I always think about, um, but by the grace of God, they go I, okay? At any moment, something can happen in our lives and we end up in the criminal justice system. Yeah. Sometimes it is something we've done and for some, it is just who they are. Um, it can happen, you know, and not, if not to us, it can happen to a family member, it can happen to a friend. So I dare say there are not many people who have not been touched by somebody who has found themselves involved in the criminal justice system. Okay. So for that reason, we all have a vested interest in trying to provide and connect resources for folks that find themselves in the criminal justice system to reduce recidivism because it helps. Mm -hmm. Our criminal justice system, I know in Henrico County takes up a lot of our tax dollars. Can you imagine what we could do with some of these tax dollars if we were able to repurpose, refocus, help people. Um, I said, and I, I didn't say a lot because I'm a talker, right? But yep. listening to all of the information that was presented and just trying to think about some things because um, we can't continue to do the same things that we've done. It's not working. Mm -hmm. We have to do something different. You know, I, I, I was just thinking about the MAT program that we're about to establish and bring in to the jail. And then thinking about all of the things that Dr. Faber identified, the, the physical being, the how do we educate people that have finished their, uh, their formal education? You know, what do we do? I'm an I'm a adult learner. I constantly read and try to stay up on um, my field. Um, I, I just love learning and, 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 and reading. But how do we educate these people now that they are finished with the formal education, the K through 12? Because there are a lot of things that they missed. I see it. You know, we assess these people when we come in. And I'm talking about right now, I have a population of uh, roughly 1,200 people between the two facilities. We process over 52,000 people through these doors every year. And there, 
there's a commonality. I looked at the, the uh, survey in reference to the number of people that have um, some kind of problem or issue with substance abuse, um, mental health issues. And yes, right on the mark, we, we uh, did a survey of roughly 1,100 um, inmates. And we found that close to 89% of those folks identified that they had an issue with substance abuse and it led directly to their incarceration. How profound is that? You know, if, if we can figure out what it is, and the thing is, the more you listen um, to uh, what Dr. Faber says in reference to brain health, um, you begin to realize why our population looks the way it does. Mm -hmm. All right, it, it, it makes so much sense. So until we start embracing that, understanding that, and finding out what we need to do on the preventative side, meaning what do we need to start? We, it's more than just educating our children because sometimes it's multi-generational, right? You can't teach what you don't know. And so you got to go beyond that. You got to go beyond the children. You know, we have them here in the jail and I look at roughly 50% of my population are here because of probation violations, meaning they committed a crime, they were being supervised, and they could not hold their end. They could not follow the rules that they were supposed to follow. How do we get them off that merry-go-round? I see them. They continue to come back. They continue to reoffend. What are we doing to get them off of that merry-go-round? Why? We, and they have a lot of commonalities, you know. But when we identify those things, what are we doing about them? You know. So I sit here and I listen, and a lot of things going through my mind because. I'm looking at ways to repurpose and programs to bring in. And I'm really thinking about having a day room where I take and we start focusing on some of the principles and the, some of the things we need to identify and bringing in the resources from the community to actually address that. So I'm excited about all of the connections. I feel like it's just, it's a God sent prayers being answered, right? Because you have this just enormous problem. And I think about like this huge elephant, how do we, how do we how do we address this? How do we take it apart? And I think that meetings like this, conversations like this are the beginning. You know, it's baby steps, right? You got to start doing, you got to start with small steps and doing things. You got to help one, that way you can help another, you know, but I'm excited. So yes, and Jamie, I have a large population of people, some of them that have nothing to do but spend time with me and test out theories, um, ranging from uh, 12 months to I have a gentleman that unfortunately just received um, two life sentences. I don't know how you get that, but anyway. Um, but a lot of them are at the, at the point in their life where they want something different and they want to know, but like, what is it? And so they are an empty vessel, some of them waiting to be filled and what an opportunity to take time to do something positive and productive and to get them on um, Get them on a better path. So like I said, I'm a talker. I'll be quiet now. But um, all of those things were just running through my mind as, as I was listening. So thank you for allowing me to, to share that and get that out. I would love to do a call, uh, Sheriff Gregory, and, and talk maybe in the next few days if you have any, you know, 20 minutes or something. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Of course, we'll have to make sure that we're involved in that conversation. Um, we certainly want to make things differently, happen differently. So our next time, um, does everybody agree that we need to do this in a month? Uh, Dr. Faber, I know that you have forgotten more than many of us will not, will know with regards to brain health. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. He's, he's very modest. His humility is, is just touching. Next time, what will we discuss so that we can continue to move forward? What do you think? Are you asking everybody or are you asking me? I'm asking you and, Ed, and everybody, what would, you, what would you all like to see us discuss the next time? I would like to see memory problems and dementia. Okay. We're taking notes, Jamie. Huh? Jamie Whitehurst. Okay, <laughs> uh, me too. Okay. Um, 
I would love to hear some more of the, the statistics from Sheriff Gregory's jail. I mean, it's like, I'm listening to this going, if I had a school where I knew uh, my kids had a 50% chance of graduating, would I send them there? Yeah, uh, probably not. So with this probation system, I mean, I'd like to know some other numbers, you know, give some other ideas on how we can follow measure um, things as well. Okay. Good. Okay. So I, can I add one? Um, because what really interests me in that, in that I'm thinking about this and managing this to the nutrition part. Um, huge for me because like I plan three meals a day, 365 days a year for the, for the residents in this facility. And so I would love to look at, am I going to be able to do it on a, a, a large scale because I'm dealing with government funds and my funds are limited. However, I'd be interested in seeing if we can um, uh, do an experiment and look at nutrition um, because I, I think that's where it begins to. You talk about um, the population and why we get a particular population. Um, and I think that nutrition plays a big part in it. You know, I, I, I volunteer at one of at my granddaughter's elementary school sometimes and just seeing some of the issues, you know, you think about some kids that the pandemic and having to close down um, in-person learning with children and some of the problems that um, children have experienced, not, not, having, not having a meal, um, not, not having, I mean, the, the simple things, you know, we take for granted um, so often. I, I keep every morning, I, I remind my granddaughter to make sure to take her vitamin um, to be able to make sure that she eats some breakfast so that she gets the brain starting um, and that she doesn't go out there at empty vessels so she can be filled by the teacher so she can receive what she's getting. Think about the children that don't have that, you know, and, and what impact is that having on their lives? So I'm really interested in um, nutrition because I, I think there's something we can do here, um, if not, not on a wide scale, but on a smart, on a small scale. Um, and probably reaching out into the community for some resources to be able to help us with that, to see what, what improvements, um, because I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly okay, you know, um, where I am in life, but I think that you can always be better. And I think like um, how Ms. Whitehurst says, I wanna know if what I'm doing, what, what's, that, what's that gonna lead in the end? I think about dementia, I think about um, some of the other issues I can have if I don't do what I'm supposed to do now. So um, I'd love to be able to add that to our conversation. Awesome. Okay. Well, this has been great. What we will do is uh, to make sure to get everybody's email address if you can think of someone else. And no, that's a different thing. Somebody else that we know would like to be on the call, then submit their names. I'll give you that email address to which, uh, let's see, watch eyes. <laughs> oh, right there. That's the email address, townhall at youthcorporation.org. Questions, feedback. We'll get that. And then Jamie, we certainly don't wanna wait a month before getting the resources for what you're asking. So we can talk offline and come up with the time that we can meet with you because I know we can come up with enough cases. And we didn't mention the fact that in addition to Sheriff Gregory's responsibility for the inmates, that she also is responsible for doing wellness checks. Mm -hmm. uh, I wasn't aware of that for the, is it for the homeless? So just give us a sentence or two about that piece of but we actually were not got to um, be a connection there too with the brain. We we actually run a, a project lifesaver, and so that is a tracking device um, that we put. And so it started off with just dealing with um, folks that were dealing with dementia that may wander, um, but our our umbrella has expanded. Um, we have uh, from a couple of years old, um, all the way up to, you know, our, our more seasoned folks in 80s and 90s. 
that we monitor with a wide range um, of issues and diagnosis. So our uh, civil process folks are out in the community, um, serving civil process, manage a caseload of folks that they, um, they do battery checks, they do wellness checks. Um, they also are, along with police and fire, the response unit when someone um, is um, unaccounted for. Um, and we utilize the tracking device to be able to find them. So um, that, that's another um, population that we're managing and it has grown from just um, maybe 10 to 15 to now we have over a hundred. Um, and like I said, the ages run the whole gamut from a couple of years old, as long as they can keep the monitor on. We've had some that asked for um, younger children that like are too small, their risk is too small for the equipment. And then um, not being able to, not tampering with it, you know, pulling it off or possibly losing it. Because the, the key is that the equipment stays in place so that if and when they wander, um, we can track them with the devices that we have. But the, the success for the program is our officers establishing relationships and rapport, you know, with not only the client, but the family member as well. Um, so sometimes they can be, um, they can do some preventative stuff, you know, um, to keep things from going away and, and our, our, our folks from wandering or going missing, so. So Doc, um, Sheriff Gregory, who pays for these devices? So right now um, it is, we have a foundation um, that's managed by um, the police department and funds are donated. The county makes a contribution um, to um, the program as well. But we get a lot of uh, anonymous and um, known business donors to the program. And what they do is they, they just pay for the equipment. Um, so the equipment, um, the, the search and rescue equipment, and then all of the devices have to have regular battery changes. Um, so we're able to put the funds out of that foundation, pay for the equipment, make sure we keep the batteries and, and um, all of the units um, up to date and working properly. Okay. What are you guys doing anything with the data? No, right now, all we do is maintain a database of um, our clients, when they go on, how often we're, we're checking with them, um, if they have any incidents where they um, wonder, um, but that, that's, about, that's about it. Okay. Okay. Wow. Yeah, I mean, my mind's spinning with stuff you could do with that information. Say that again, Dr. Well, Faber. my mind's spinning with, I mean, the stuff you could do with that information, you know, any of these like new technological devices. And, and this is the first I've heard of, of this type of device following this kind of information. It'd be fascinating to take a look at and see what types of trends are occurring and then coming up with other solutions. Um, you know, on, on that front, but just several fronts. I mean, think of parents with, you know, kids, if they had something like that, where, where are they going? Who are they hanging out with? Um, but I'd love to hear more about it at some point. That'd be great. Okay. So we want to get track the children on the cell phones and have cell phone technology that can track your children, whether they're on foot or in the car. Yeah. We, we actually now utilize an app called SmartLink. Um, and we're utilizing that app now for people that are on um, bond and it has uh, facial recognition. Um, we use the, that uh, technology for check-ins to be able to verify their location where they are. We can send information back and forth. They can send back uh, documentation that they have an appointment and say that I'm going to the doctor that's approved. They can actually take a picture of the doctor's note and send that right to us and we upload that. We can send them information and resources that they may need. Um, we can keep them uh, do check-ins for their court appearances, especially those ones that are, are on probation um, violation and, and their pre-trial. So yes, like you said, the technology that's out there, I don't think we have fully tapped in to um, all of the uses um, that we have, but we have been able to tap in and use the, the SmartLink app is much cheaper than those big bulky GPS units that we use and that we still use, 
for some folks because um you just have to have that kind of supervision but there is a lot of technology out there that um that i think we're just beginning to tap in to the use let alone being able to use it as a parent i would have loved to have it for my three when they <laughs> telling me where they were and that look and that was pre-cell phone age right so at least now parents got a cell phone this is when i had to wait and see and figure out whose house you was over so i could call their mama or get in my car and go try to track you down so amen, amen for technology okay so yeah i'm trying to be calm okay i don't know if this ground thing is working um Next month, Dr. Paper, how about, I know you have a, a patient load and we certainly have to respect that. Yeah, just if I know the sooner I know, the better. Okay. And, right. uh, you know, and then um, I may reach out to some people, just throwing some ideas as well, how we could even do some fun stuff together. Okay, that sounds good. And Jamie, we will be getting back with you um, before the end of the week. How about that? Okay. Uh, couldn't hear you, Jamie. Unmute, please. That's excellent. Thank you very much. I appreciate yes, it. Absolutely. We we have the, the resources for which you're looking. Come going to Sundance. Yeah. <laughs> for sure. Okay. <laughs> art so, is the art is the best way to get people to see things that they wouldn't normally look at. It's the best, it's like a can opener or a laser cutter. It you can shine the light. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, does anybody else have anything they want to add right now before we conclude? And no, everybody's being quiet, but thank you for your patience as we got started. Um, go ahead, Dr. Faber, you're going to say no, something. No, thank you. I was just say thank you, Deborah. I mean, you are doing, a, to me, a, a great job uh, bringing everyone together and creating a spirit of collaboration and teamwork. Uh, my hat's off to you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Deborah. It's, you know, um, I just feel really uh, honored to have been a part of this and to be here and thank you for putting this together. Oh, absolutely. And uh, is Liz Charity still there? We'll get together. We have a meeting and you know, yeah, a meeting after the meeting, we'll have a meeting after the meeting. <laughs> yes, I'm still here. <laughs> okay. So I think that uh, with that, I'll conclude. Does anybody, I just want to make sure don't leave out anybody who wants to say something. Okay. Remember that email address. Um, yeah. Okay. We're done. Right. Okay. okay. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you, everyone. Here. Bye-bye. 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 Sheriff Gregory, and she's left. Okay. Liz?